We begin with the integral of e to the negative x squared. At the first glance, it looks harmless, just another exponential integral. However, there is no way to write its antiderivative using usual functions like polynomials, exponents functions, or trigonometric functions. That's what makes our function so special. To work with it, we mathematicians define the error function erf of x as 2 over square root of pi times the integral from 0 to x of e to the negative t squared dt. That constant factor makes the function align with probability theory where it describes cumulative areas under the Gaussian curve. So when we look at the graph for this, this e to the negative t squared, on this graph you will see the familiar bell-shaped curve of e to the negative t squared. As we move along the x-axis, the error function measures how much area we've swept under the curve. Starting near zero, it steadily rises and eventually leveling off at one. Going to negative x makes it drop towards negative one, showing its symmetry in the bell curve. So the indefinite integral is written in terms of erf of x. Far from being a curiosity, this function appears everywhere in heat diffusion, normal distribution and statistics, quantum mechanics. Anytime you've seen Gaussian probability, we are talking about a bell curve in this instance. And when we're taking our integral under it, we need to define a special function because we cannot take an integral using our elementary functions. So, ERF is always behind the scenes when it comes to a bell curve. Now, let's look at its other counterpart, which is ERF E, um, which is the imaginary. Now let's flip the sign of the exponent and instead we have e to the x squared which in an indefinite integral is which is actually harder to deal with because it gr grows exponentially. So we define erf e of x as 2 over square root of pi times the integral from 0 to x of e to the t squared dt. So Despite its name, it is actually revalued, real value, because it just comes from the analytic continuation of the function. The formula is sim similar to the error function, but with e raised to the t squared instead of negative t squared. And here, we're going to plot e to the t squared. And notice how quickly that it shoots upward, even for even for some lower values of t, the values are going to just blast up into the air. That means that the, air, the imaginary error function, erfi, grows very fast compared to erf, which always stays bounded. This function shows up a lot in wave propagation, in certain solutions to the heat equation, and also in quantum mechanics as well, when we're talking about uh, inverted Gaussian terms. It's a reminder that changing one sign in the exponent can change a lot about how a function behaves and how we're going to take the integral. So the integral from e of e to the x squared dx is the square root of pi over 2 imaginary error function of x plus c. So we cannot define that using elementary functions. So Erfi is different than the error function because it shoots up exponentially and it has a completely separate behavior to that of error function. Next, let's look at the sine integral, psi of x. So now we look at the oscillatory integrals where the integrand uh, wiggles endlessly, as you will see. Consider we have the integral of sine of, sine of x over x dx. This ratio arises in wave physics and Fourier analysis a lot. We define the integral sine uh, psi of x 
as the integral from 0 to x of sine t over t dt. It looks undefined at 0. The limit exists and equals 1. So the integral actually does make sense. So when we're looking at its oscillatory behavior, what we want to look at is its graph. So its graph is the sync function. So it oscillates crossing the axis repeatedly while slowly decaying in amplitude. When we integrate it, the oscillations accumulate, giving c of x, which levels off towards a constant value around 1.57, about so. But why does this even matter? Why do we need uh, psi of x? Well, we need psi of x because sine and cosine integrals describe different diffraction patterns. Antenna radiation, signal processing filters, and are used in analyzing waves. They are used anytime waves need to be understood in terms of spreading their interference. So this is very useful in physics, and it is also very useful in uh, engineering as well for this exact purpose because we're looking at we're looking at signal and breaking down waves into small parts sine and cosine next we have the gamma function the gamma function is one of the most famous special functions because it's basically the continuous factorial. So its definition is gamma of x equals the integral from 0 to infinity of t raised to the x minus 1 e to the negative t dt. And one of the most important things about this is that it collapses to gamma of n equals n minus 1 factorial but the gamma function works for even fractions and complex number which fills in the gap in the factorial function because remember when we're taking a factorial we just if we say we have three factorial we're talking about three times two times one but what about one half factorial gamma is what gives us that little gap so if we plot the integrand for x equals 3, it looks like t squared e to the negative t because it rises first because of the t squared term, but it decays over time, forcing it back down. This delicate balance is what makes the gamma function finite. So this is how we define uh, certain factorials that are fractions or just negative numbers, not integers. So some of the best applications for this are, are probability theory and gamma distribution. It can also help in a lot in number theory as well, defining what one half factorial may be or what a negative factorial could mean. It also appears in physics with partition functions and statistical mechanics. A lot and a lot of these special functions have to do with statistical mechanics because of their wave and analytical type behavior and anytime factorials extend beyond the integers then this is the tool we'll use so next is the Bessel the basal functions JV of X so Next is the Bessel function, which naturally appears when solving differential equations in cylindrical or spherical coordinates. So they're defined by an oscillatory integral, j sub 0 equals 1 over pi times the integral from 0 to pi of cosine of x sine tau d tau. So while well, we have a complicated while it's complicated in definition, they behave like damped oscillations. And you'll see when you'll see visually what I mean by these oscillations are damped. So when we look at the graph 
of uh, j zero of x notice that we have a wave like pattern it starts at one and oscillates with decreasing amplitude unlike sine or cosine its zeros are equally spaced and its decay is much slower than that of sine or cosine functions. The result, the bezel function describes vibrations, electromagnetic waves, and solutions to radial heat equations when we're talking about oscillatory and cylindrical problems. So whenever we have a physics problem where we're looking at it from a, a oscillatory or spherical or cylindrical angle, we're going to want to apply bezel functions um, if we have symmetry because that will help us easier solve the problem because sometimes the answer is cannot be found using elementary functions. Next is the poly logarithm function. Li of s of x equals 1 over the gamma function of s times the integral from 0 to infinity of t raised to the s minus 1 over e to the t over x minus 1. For s equals 2, we get a di logarithm which links directly to the famous constants of the Raymond zeta function. Very interesting part of math. While it's way harder to actually visualize uh, Li as a polylogarithmic function, we can approximate Li2 between 0 and 1. It rises smoothly, curving towards known values like zeta of 2 equals pi squared over 6 when x equals 1. So while this function is very complicated, there is still a lot that we are trying to figure out about it, especially because we're talking about uh, the Raymond zeta function and its solutions, which are still not uh, very well known or not very researched upon yet because of its complex, uh, complex math behind it. So polylogarithms, they appear in quantum statistics, especially in Fermi-Dirac and Bose-Einstein distributions, and, and they also show up in knot theory, algebraic geometry, and obviously zeta values when we're talking about the Raymond zeta function and trying to find the solutions to that function. They're a bridge between physics and also mathematics too because this function is mainly mathematical. And there's still a lot we don't know about this function. But maybe one day we'll be able to, we'll be able to know even more about this type of function. And lastly is the Fresnel integrals, C of x and S of x. So our final example comes from integrating cosine of t squared and sine of t squared. So these are called the Fresnel integrals. We define c of x as the integral from 0 to x of cosine of t squared dt and s of x as the integral of 0 to x of sine of t squared dt. Together, they trace a two-dimensional curve known as a Cornu spiral. So here is the actual Cornu spiral itself. So C of x is on the horizontal axis, and S of x is on the vertical axis. The curve begins near the origin, spirals outward, and it curls inward again. So this is showing us the behavior uh, of the oscillatory behavior of the sine and cosine functions as they are working together here. So some applications of this, they're essential in optics as well. They make uh, core new spirals. 
They describe diffraction patterns and how light bends around its edges. Engineers use them with radar, antennas, and imaging technology, as those are also related to optics. The Cornu spiral is basically a tool for predicting how the waves spread. So these functions are extremely important when looking at light. Anyways, I hope you like this video. Please like, subscribe. We're trying to get to 200 subscribers by the end of this video.